Okay, today I'm very, very excited. Uh, I've got a guest on the show who is a guy that I have been reading for about 10 years now, and I would be hard-pressed to probably find any other single author whose work has brought a more a deeper transformation in my life, who has opened the scriptures to me, who has opened uh, God and uh, has revealed the beauty of Jesus to me. Uh, this is a this is pivotal in stuff in my in my life. So uh, I'm excited that I get to introduce you all to Frank Viola. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing great, and I'm very happy to be on the show. And thanks for those all too kind words. I'm humbled and honored by them. <laughs> well, uh, I know a lot of my friends and listeners here have been reading your books as well, so I'm excited to uh, get to get to introduce you to to some folks. Uh, for those who don't know, Frank and I have interacted in the real world twice. This relationship is not solely me reading his books from a distance and and putting my comments out there, but we have sat around a table. Then I have not recovered yet from those two visits with you, Jonathan. <laughs> I have not yet recovered. <laughs> so Pagan Christianity was the book that started the journey for me. I was at a point where I was uh, burned out on institutional church, and I knew that there must be something else richer to experience, and I didn't know what that was, and I didn't have language to describe it, and so I was just kind of stuck in a frustrated position. I came upon this book called Pagan Christianity. I read it in a couple of days, and it was like, whoa! It gave language to all these kinds of things that I was wrestling with, and then over a course of uh, years, I began to read Frank's other books, uh, Reimagining Church, which is a, a, a partner component piece to the pagan Christianity, from uh, Eternity to Here, which is a just a mind-altering perspective on God, and a number of his other works. And throughout all of them, Frank, it seems to me that you're you're wrestling with like it's like we don't understand how great Christ is. It's it's like there's mm -hmm. something about Christ that you're constantly pushing forth. What's that journey been like for you? Where where has this come from? Good question. I think it dates back to when I was in my early 20s. I'd come to the Lord when I was 16 and got involved with just about every tribe in the Christian faith, various denominations, parachurch organizations, movements, etc. And there came a point where I discovered that there was deep within me a cry that said, essentially, there's got to be more than this. There has to be more than what I'm hearing, what I'm seeing, what I'm experiencing. And that set me on an odyssey where I began to look far and wide to people who knew who knew the Lord better than I do and who really knew him in a living experience. So that has been a lifetime pursuit of mine. And I have found that Jesus Christ is effectively the only thing that doesn't wear out. Everything <laughs> else in the Christian world wears out eventually, whether it's a method, a technique, a teaching, a doctrine, you name it, the, the <laughs> list is long. And, you know, there is a reality in Christ. There is a reality of knowing him and seeing him and having the veil pulled back. Once we get a glimpse of his greatness, we are essentially wrecked and ruined for anything else. And so what it tends to do is we begin to look at everything else with a completely different lens. And we we often see that there's so much in Christianity today that is shallow at best, or it just stops at the frontal lobe, you know, and doesn't go beyond the cranium, and it's all heady and intellectual. Either that or it's highly emotional, and the emotion wears off, and now we're running for the next thing that we relate to Jesus Christ. So so my work has really been to try to clear away all the brush so that we can see the Lord anew and afresh and really get to know him personally. And to me, that's that's the name of the game. Like Paul said near the end of his life, Here's a man who knew Jesus Christ better than most everyone walking during his time. And he says in Philippians that I may know him. So something happened to him. He was the man who penned Colossians, which is just a stunning <laughs> Absolutely. revelation of Jesus Christ, of which we can never exhaust, no matter how many times we read that book, preach on it, teach on it, expound it, explore it. 
he really is unfathomable in his riches, as Paul says in Ephesians. So, so that really is the heart of it. And I think it's difficult, Jonathan, because a lot of us, we have filters. So when you talk about Jesus, the response quickly is, oh, yeah, well, he's my Savior. He's my Lord. I got the T-shirt. Uh, let's move on to other things. But right. if you really have seen the Christ of Colossians, for example, or the Christ of Ephesians, there is nothing else. <laughs> the rest of life is a pursuit of knowing him, exploring him, and learning how to live by his indwelling life. Amen. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I like how Paul, I think, I don't remember where, but, he, but Paul says, you know, there's only a handful of people basically who knew Christ. You guys, the apostles, oh, and me. Um, it, right. it always gives me a little giggle. Jesus, a theography would be, I think, kind of your, like your big, big work that would maybe be focused on Jesus in a biographical sense. When I look at your high water marks, I would s sort of say we've got pagan Christianity slash reimagining church mm -hmm. from eternity to here, Jesus, mm -hmm. a theography. And mm -hmm. now I would say your new book, Insurgents, Reclaiming the Gospel of the Kingdom. Do you feel mm -hmm. I've missed any kind of high points out? Or, or are they? Are all your children your favorites? Uh, no, all of them are not. All of them are not. No, I think you listed uh, the main ones. I, I would throw in there two more. One is the book that came out before Jesus of Theography. It's called Jesus Manifesto. It's a shorter book that Leonard Sweet and I wrote together. But we basically take dead aim at everything that has eclipsed the person of Jesus Christ in the Christian faith, things that Christians chase after, whether it's leadership principles, the power of the Holy Spirit, signs and wonders, evangelism, apologetics. These are all it's, okay? Right. Evangelism is an it. Apologetics is an it. Signs and wonders is an it. But we don't need an it. We need a him. And when God's people chase those things, even though they're related to Christ, they are not Christ himself. Mm. And so we talk about something called JDD, Jesus Deficit Disorder. And so <laughs> what the book tries to do is expose what that is. It really is in the drinking water of the Christian faith, whether it's the progressive left or the conservative right. We have it in spades. And we're not really aware of it until someone peels back the layers and shows us who Jesus Christ really is in a way that we've never seen nor experienced nor imagined. And then we begin to say, oh, that's right. I was chasing a thing about Christ, not Christ himself. Yeah. So that's what that book is about. And it was interesting because we had endorsements from the entire spectrum of the Christian faith, all the way from the Archbishop of Canterbury to some of the Reformed guys, to some of the leading Arminian leaders, on through you know Baptists, Pentecostals, Charismatics, and on and on. It was singing a song that many Christians felt needed to be sung, didn't even realize of the need until they looked at the book and read it. And so that was the precursor to Jesus of Theography, which you mentioned. And the other book I would throw in there is one called God's Favorite Place on Earth. Oh, yeah. Which was my first, hi thank you, it was my hybrid where I mixed fiction with nonfiction into something I call biblical narrative. And in this book, Lazarus, he's an old man, he's getting ready to die, and he tells the story of when Jesus came to his hometown the little town of Bethany, and the things that took place there. And so it kind of reads like a movie, and I had uh, one of the leading, I would say he is the leading New Testament scholar as far as first century history is concerned, Craig Keener, Dr. Craig Keener. He's my historical advisor and made sure that every part of that story was accurate and faithful to both the New Testament and church history and first century history. So that was a compelling book. For many readers, it brings many of the gospel stories of Mary and Martha, Lazarus, et cetera, to life. Yeah, I, I love that one as well. And uh, I felt, uh, I think it was the one that came after that was uh, The Day I Met Jesus had a similar kind of yes. biblical narrative approach and it yes. opened up a bunch of things. I, I had to go through this really quite painful deconstruction process uh, that I know a lot of other folks, certainly folks in my generation especially, seem to have had a real wrestle with stuff and have had to tear down a lot of what we thought about the church, thought about God, in order to fall back in love with Christ. 
Mm. Uh, and that's exactly yes. what, what happened to me as I, as I mm. left traditional understanding of church or common modern understanding of church, shall we say, and kind of journeyed out into the wilderness. Oh, surprise. Who's out in the wilderness? God doing just fine, <laughs> waiting, <laughs> waiting for all of us. And mm. uh, out there, I fell head over heels in love with mm. with the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. My my wife was so confused because when we got married, she was kind of a bit more out in front spiritually and she was expecting to to get this great spiritual husband who would be on his <laughs> knees every morning crying out to his to God for his his wife and family and and that was not me and she was felt kind of like she'd been tricked. And for the first couple of years, mm -hmm. I was like, well, whatever, I'm not going to fake it. I like, I, I believe in God, but I, you know, I would say I love Jesus. But, but when I fell in love with Jesus, man, everything paled in comparison. And, mm -hmm. and to be honest, my wife wasn't totally, she didn't really believe it at first. She was kind of like, we'll wait and see how, how it plays out. <laughs> but, but I would wake up in the middle of the night for, just from being deeply asleep. And I would wake up with the praises of the Lord on my lips mm -hmm. and, uh, my my heart was just bursting with with love for the lord uh, which eventually god was like hey listen if you can prize me out here uh, you can prize me anywhere and uh so frank's latest book is as i mentioned before insurgents reclaiming the gospel of the kingdom five seconds what's your elevator pitch what is this book <laughs> my elevator pitch i guess would simply be that most of us have never heard the gospel of the kingdom and yet it is the most powerful message in the entire New Testament, and it has the power in and of itself, once we hear it in its totality, to titanically and radically revolutionize, and I would use this word, radicalize us to Jesus Christ. Just like people who join terrorist organizations are radicalized to their false cause, this is what the gospel of the kingdom does, and it's what happened in the first century, and there is an insurgence happening today that's doing that very thing. So that would be my elevator pitch. <laughs> very good. I'm going to read two statements that you put into the, into the first section of this book because it segues nicely here from, from this whole thing about Christ. And uh, I think in, in many ways, what I've, as I've come away reading this one, I feel like this is kind of like the – this is what's been brewing – in you all along, and and I, I th I'm excited for other people to to digest this one. So, two things that you've written here: the antidote to spiritual boredom, which plagues many Christians, including leaders, is to receive a fresh awakening of the beauty of Christ. Mm. And then a little later, you wrote, an unveiling of Christ to our hearts then is the necessary prerequisite to a genuine surrender to the Lord Jesus. And that mm. is the starting point of the insurgents. So we, so we begin this process of radicalization by being, would you say, you know, radicalized, capturing a radical vision of the beauty of Christ himself? Yeah, that's the starting point. And it's also what maintains that utter and complete abandonment and devotion. You know, the reason why those 12 apostles and those five to eight women forsook all is because their eyes had been opened to see the absolute beauty, majesty, glory of Jesus Christ. This is so vital, and it's why I start the book out with trying to present Christ in such a way that readers will just be captivated by him particularly his beauty and splendor, is because today in the Christian world, the favorite tool of the preacher to try to get people to submit to Jesus, to give their life to Jesus, to obey Jesus, the favorite tool in their hand is guilt. Hmm. And as I put it in one book, the average preacher today needs a travel agent to handle all the guilt trips <laughs> he puts on God's people. The problem with guilt is it's like a rubber band. It doesn't last very long. Hmm. As a motivator, it's horrible. And not only that, but it breeds its own disease. Jesus Christ came to deliver us from guilt and condemnation. And so that does not lead us to the Lord, not in any lasting sense. What really leads us to him is to have that unveiling to see exactly who this Lord of ours is. And that's what I try to do in the beginning of the book. I take the reader through a number of the stories in the Gospels by putting the reader there. It, it's as if it's happening to you. 
you know, you are the Samaritan woman at the well. You are the woman caught in adultery. You're Peter who kept failing and failing and failing and committed the ultimate sin of all sins, the sin that eclipses whatever any of us have done, and that is the denial of his own Lord, not in front of a, a great leader who's putting a lot of pressure on him, but in front of a maid, you know, and not once, twice, but three times. And so if Peter could really blow it, and I mean blow it big, and yet he becomes the chief of all apostles, then boy, there's hope for you and there's hope for me. So so I present the Lord in his beauty in the beginning of the book, and that sets the stage for now that we have seen him, now that he has enraptured our hearts, what now is that titanic, earth-shaking, powerful, unbelievable gospel of the kingdom? But that seems to me to be the missing point, is preachers, and I'm around them all the time and I speak with them, It's it really comes down to God is holy, you're not, try harder. Mm. And that seems to be the main message. That's the message of legalism, and that's one of the Gospels that I talk about. The Gospel of legalism is, yeah, you're saved by grace, but you have to maintain it by works. And this puts you on this treadmill of constant performance. The response to that, which is the other gospel, is the gospel of libertinism, and that's where so many Christians have been burned out by trying to be good Christians and failing the Lord and being put under a pile of guilt and condemnation and and all sorts of legalism. Now they latch on to grace, and so the message becomes, because you're under grace, it doesn't really matter how you live. And so that's the other counterfeit gospel, and then breaking through both is the gospel of the kingdom, which I seek to uncork in the book. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. This The, the kind of hyper grace thing is definitely something that uh, I, that some of my own leaders and pastors have been really wrestling with and have had a real concern about. And it's been an interesting point of dialogue uh, between us at some times because I think some of my leadership have been concerned that essentially because me and many of my peers are a certain age that we must be going in for that message. And what I keep coming back to is, look, I I love the Lord. I don't want to grieve the Lord's heart. Mm -hmm. Just because I could say like, yeah, sure, shall we sin more so that grace may abound more? Mm -hmm. Uh, This is not a new problem. Mm, It's it's like, I don't want to, I don't want to grieve the heart of my lover in the same way I don't want to grieve my wife's heart. So somewhere in here, as we're capturing a vision of Christ, there, there's two words that's just jumping out of my mind when I think of the, the disciples and the, the other women who came with them, as you mentioned, you know, forsaking all, mm-hmm. uh, yes. which to me is perhaps not the most popular sermon title in modern Christianity. But, but we see there's this detachment. There's something about the first believers. There's something about the early church uh, where there's a... A, a disconnection from the powers surrounding them. They're they're coming to live under a new covenant. One of the more real fascinating parts of the book for me was the discussion on principalities and powers. Mm. Uh, we know that when we think about you know these mountains of influence in the world, um, you know, like mm-hmm. you said, entertainment, uh, education, uh, wealth, business, society, politics, all of these things. It's easy to be like, oh yeah things that Christians need to be careful about. But I don't think I had really gone to the extent in my own thinking of of really assigning demonic entities to those things. Uh, and, and your argument there is that far from simply being neutral structures that exist, these are actually very systematically designed things to distract us. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely, and ensnarl us and ensnare us. And this is all about the discussion of the world system, which I talk a lot about in the book. And I think that Christians today are are not really familiar. I'm speaking in generalities here, of course, but there's an unclarity on what the world system is. John tells us, love not the world, nor the things in the world. Now, he's not talking about the earth, and he's not talking about the people in the world. He's talking about a system. Paul talks about it when he says that 
Satan is the god of this world. Jesus identified Satan as being the prince of this world. There is a system on the earth, and I trace the origin of it going back to Genesis 4, when Cain left the presence of God and he built what we call fallen human civilization. And it is a counterfeit to the kingdom of God. It was a counterfeit to the Garden of Eden. It is a counterfeit to the kingdom of God today. And so the intricacies of how the world system works are very, very powerful. And one of the things that happens when a person becomes radicalized to Jesus Christ is they break the loyalty oath to the world system. And uh, this is what baptism was in the first century. It was a literal watery grave where the individual had broken all their ties to the world system. They no longer pledged their allegiance to the flags of this world. They became, in every way, a citizen of a new kingdom, of a new creation, of a new civilization, as it were. This has really been lost to us. The discussion on the principalities and powers in the book, I think, is fascinating, and I give all my documentation there, looking at scholars and what they've uncovered. But I pieced it all together, and it was just stunning to me. I feel like that is uh, probably a huge course correction for a lot of us, I would say in the West especially. Ever since I read that, uh, I've been just chewing over it for the last few weeks. And man, every time I'm tempted to engage in some Twitter rage war uh, or anything (laughs) relating to politics or religion or education or anything, ringing now in my head is... It's not flesh and blood, man. It's not flesh and blood. And again, mm. I've, I've known that, but it's, it's like a, a deeper understanding for me. Yeah, there's more going on that me, than meets the eye, which again, I've, I would have always said, yeah, of course I know that. It's definitely been a, a shift in, in my understanding of the world around me, especially when we think about like the world of media and the world of politics. And it's like, it's like these two elephants just raging at one another, right? And all of a sudden I'm like, oh, wow, yeah, it's because it like literally probably is two demonic powers raging against one another. Uh, Fascinating. Okay, wow, now I can leave that over there and keep my eyes on Christ uh, and have have a different set of focuses and priorities. I like that you brought that up because I want to riff on that just a little bit. What I do in the book, too, is I explain the tentacles that belong to the world system. And as you mentioned The political system of our day, I don't care what country you're in, it doesn't matter, Canada or the United States or you name it. But basically, the political system is and has always been part of the world system. And Jesus Christ is not head of that system. It has the fingerprints of God's enemy on it. This is the reason why when many good, upstanding people who have integrity get involved in the political system, Virtually every single one of them, without exception, is corrupted at some level, in some way, either great or small, there is some element of corruption. And this is because that system is not under the headship of Christ. Okay, now, when you go back to the first century, you find that there was a political system operating during that time. And you had, in effect, the Sadducees on the one hand, who were the liberals and the moderates of that day, and you had the Pharisees on the other, who were the conservatives of that day. (laughs) Yeah, it's fascinating. And so you have the Sadducees who practiced appeasement toward the Roman occupying presence in Israel, and they were all about protecting their political party. Then you had the Pharisees who were the scrupulous taking the moral high ground, uh, (laughs) observers of the Hebrew law, which basically in their interpretation of it reached way beyond what the law said. And they added this massive addenda of oral tradition, interpretations, explanations, human made rules, obligations, etc. And so in effect, they both were leveraging political power. Mm -hmm. And then Jesus Christ comes along and he doesn't side with either the Sadducees. They become irate with him. He doesn't side with the Pharisees. They are apoplectic about (laughs) him. And he is coming from a totally different perspective. His whole viewpoint is from the heavenly realm. His whole message is the kingdom of God. And Jonathan, the kingdom of God and the gospel of the kingdom did not fit the progressive left back 
back in the first century, nor the conservative right, and neither does it do so today. One of the flaws, and I go into this in the book, is that Christian people, that's all they really know, Mm. and they can't seem to think past progressive left political right. And so the talking points, whenever they speak on political or social issues, all it does is it echoes what they're hearing from those political vantage points. And Jesus Christ is coming from a totally different place, just like he always has and just like he does today. It is a mistake for God's people to sit at Caesar's table and leverage the power of the world system, a la political power, to try to achieve heavenly aims. Mm. When you peel back the onion of all of the political bickering and vitriol on either side of the aisle— They really are using the same methodology, and they're really speaking from the same vantage point. They're just cutting the moral line in a different place. Mm, Yeah, right. It's like a a sacred cow, right? Especially for many Christians. Absolutely. I would go a step further, and I would say that if, if you are someone who has a body of evangelical Christians who are wedded to the conservative right, and you bring in a different vantage point, you are definitely going to have people who are going to become offended and don't want to hear what you have to say. On the other hand, if you have a group of followers who are wedded to the progressive left, and you bring in another vantage point, you're going to have the same exact reaction because, brother, both the progressive left and the conservative right, and I'm speaking contemporaneously here, I'm speaking in contemporary terms and generalities, but both are eating from the same tree. Mm. And there is another tree but it's completely different. This is why when Jesus Christ, if you ever see his dialogue with Pharisees and Sadducees, and the same thing with Paul of Tarsus, you ever see his dialogue, he's asked a question, and he so often answers in a way that nobody would even imagine. It, it almost <laughs> seems like he's answering a different question. That's right? it. That's it. That's because he is eating from a different tree. He is laser locked into the kingdom of God and the gospel of the kingdom, and he has that perspective dominating. And just like a hot knife through butter, that message of the gospel of the kingdom cuts through both the progressive left and the conservative right. And I would really admonish or encourage rather anybody who deep down inside looks at all the vitriol and the bickering back and forth and deep down says, you know what, there has to be something other than this. There's got to be a third way of (laughs) looking at all of this, you know, down to the way we discuss, but not even that. I'm talking about the actual perspective we have. And I've written the book not only for so many other Christians who are seeking, uh, you know, there must be more than this, but also I think it's really helping people find a different way when it comes to this whole political issue and how it's divided so many of the Lord's people. Seriously. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, It's good stuff, everybody. I recommend you read it.